Hello and welcome back. Once again, this is Clinical Optics Made Easy Optics Series. Uh, today we're talking about astigmatism. This is brought to you by the great people at Davis Street Publishing. Thank you to them. I am your intrepid uh, narrator, M.N. Wiggins, and we are going to jump right in. So in today's talk, we're going to be discussing the topics you see here, all about keratometry readings, the conoid of sturm. We're going to look at a manual keratometer that's almost 100 years old. And we're going to discuss barbecue, which is uh, very dear to my heart. And if we have time, we're going to discuss with the rule and against the rule of stigmatism. And as I will say in each of these lectures, all of the material that I'm presenting to you is available in Clinical Optics Made Easy. And you can see the different ways that you can find that book if that's the one you want. But find an optics book that is right for you, something that you can identify with the reading, that it speaks to you, uh, you know. But... The real key to learning optics and the secret is working lots and lots of problems. And that's what we built into that book is to give you over 800 questions. But again, lots of optics books out there. All I really care about is that you're learning the material. Let's talk about the cornea optically. The cornea is a large plus lens on the front surface. On the back surface, it's a small minus lens. And in ophthalmology, we love to pretend. For example, we love to pretend that the cornea is a clock, and that way we can talk about where things are in terms of clock hours. Obviously, the cornea is not a clock. You cannot look at someone's eye and tell what time it is. If you can, please send me a photograph of that. I think that would be fascinating. And when we're not talking about the cornea as a clock, we're talking about the oval cornea as a circle. It's clearly not a circle, uh, but we like to pretend that it is. And if we do, we can describe locations of things in terms of 360 degrees. And we use the term meridian for this. And so a meridian is a line from the limbus through the center of the cornea out the other side of the limbus. And so if you draw a line uh, from 0 to 180, that would be the 0, 180 meridian. And you could name it for either side of the line, 0 or 180. You wouldn't use both. And again, uh, if you wanted a vertical meridian, you would talk about the 90 degree meridian or the 270 degree meridian. And if we want to measure the power of the cornea, we need a device like this. This is a keratometer. This keratometer was built in the 1930s. However, it does the same thing as the manual keratometers in your clinic. It's taking a reflection off the cornea and it's using a formula to calculate the power of the cornea in different places. And these are called keratometry readings, or as the cool kids say, the K readings. So here's an example of some K readings. You can see here 42 diopters vertically, 90 to 70 meridian, and 42 diopters horizontally, 0, 180. K readings always tell you the steepest, most powerful meridian and the weakest, flattest meridian. So they always come in a pair and they're brackets. That means that every other meridian is somewhere in between these two. But if the two numbers are the same, that means that all the meridians are the same power, in this case, 42 diopters. That's called a spherical cornea. And if that cornea were a pizza, it would be a single topping pepperoni pizza that you see here. Doesn't matter if I cut this pizza in half vertically, horizontally, at any other angle, I'm going to get pepperoni on both sides. So diagrammatically, if I look at this, I've got 42 diopters along the 90 to 70 meridian. These are the vertical rays going through the cornea. And I have 42 going through the 0, 180 meridian or the horizontal rays. And if I put those together, you can see through the magic of PowerPoint that those come to a single focal point. But what if you and I are ordering a pizza and you really like pepperoni and I really don't? So here we've ordered a half pepperoni, half Canadian bacon pizza. This represents an astigmatic cornea. And you can see the K readings here. The two numbers are not the same. And so that tells you that it absolutely matters how we slice this pizza as to how much pepperoni and how much Canadian bacon are going to be on the, the slices or the halves, depending upon how many times we cut it. So this cornea is not spherical. It's not pepperoni all the way around. It is aspherical or astigmatic. So astigmatic means that those two numbers on your K readings are different. 
And when we talk about a patient's astigmatism, the amount that they have, when we're talking about the amount that's coming from the cornea, we're talking about the difference in those two numbers. So this patient, at least for their cornea, would have two diopters of astigmatism. And that's really all that astigmatism is. So let's look at this diagrammatically. Up top, you see the, the stronger vertical meridian is uh, coming together at a shorter focal length than the bottom flatter meridian down there. And why that's important is because when we put these two together, now we're trying to look at one object, but our focal points are at two different distances this causes blurry vision, and this is why your patients do not like their astigmatism. So here I'm showing you a spherical cornea up on top, and it doesn't matter if the rays are coming vertically or horizontally, everything comes to a nice and happy single point. Now on the bottom diagram, however, this is an astigmatic cornea, and they do not come to a single point. Uh, this really does matter which way you cut the pizza. And all I'm showing you on this first diagram are the vertical black lines. And as these rays start to converge, they form these blurry ovals that you see here that become progressively thinner until they're a solitary line. And these vertical rays are going to form a horizontal line, and we can do an experiment later on to show you that. Uh, but afterwards, uh, you get these progressively bigger ovals. But these aren't the only rays going through. Here you see the horizontal red rays going through. Now, I know that it may not look horizontal, but uh, just work with me here. This is the absolute best artistic representation that I can do. Uh, but these are red uh, horizontal rays, and they give you uh, progressively thinner uh, blurry ovals as they converge until it gives you a solitary single line. And then everything else after that becomes uh, a bigger oval. Now, what if I were to overlay the vertical rays on top of these horizontal rays? What would that look like? It would look like this mess. So let me walk you through this diagram one more time. I have black vertical rays hitting my lens, and they're forming these horizontal ovals that get thinner and thinner until it forms that black horizontal line. And then the rays diverge again and form bigger ovals as they go out. Now, horizontal rays that are in red here are hitting the lens and they are forming vertical red ovals that become thinner and thinner until it forms a vertical red line and then it diverges again forming vertical ovals. I want you to forget all about the ovals for right now and I want you to focus just on that black horizontal line being formed by the vertical rays and that red vertical line being formed by the red horizontal rays. The distance between those two lines is the conoid of Sturm that we've been talking about. And pay particular attention to that yellow-purple circle, that tiny little circle in between those two lines in the middle of the conoid. That is called the circle of least confusion, which is an interesting name because it's all kinds of confusing. But it's also the spherical equivalent. So let's go back to our K readings. I've got two diopters of astigmatism here. How long is the conoid of Sturm? Why do we care how long the coronal of Sturm is? Uh, we're going to come to that. So, But first, let's just figure out how long it is. So the way that we figure that out is just as we did in the first chapter. We take uh, the power and diopters and we divide it into 100 to get the length in centimeters. So 42 divided by 100 is 2.38. You can see what it is with 40. And so if I want to know the length of the conoid of Sturm, I would subtract those two values, and as you can see there, it is 0.12 centimeters. So again, why do we care about the length of the conoid of Sturm? I will show you in subsequent lectures, but I will just tell you now that the longer the conoid of Sturm, the more blurry it is for your patient. So we want that conoid of Sturm to be as small as possible, meaning that as little difference as possible between those two K readings. Going back to our keratometer, it's important to know uh, how this thing works, at least optically speaking. So the keratometer measures the radius of curvature of the central cornea. And I know what you're thinking. What the heck is radius of curvature? So I want you to take a, a racquetball or a tennis ball, whatever, and cut it in half, or at least do that mentally. 
and I want you to find the exact geometric center of that racquetball. Now, once you have that point, draw a line from that point to the inside wall of the racquetball, and that is radius of curvature. So when your manual keratometer is giving you a reading, it's measuring the refracting power of the cornea using that formula right there. So n prime minus n is the difference in the refractive indices divided by the radius of curvature. And this is one of the few times in optics where we cannot use centimeters and we have to use meters. Let me show you this uh, as it might appear in a problem. So you're measuring a radius of curvature of seven millimeters. What's the refracting power of the cornea? So let's look at this formula in a little more detail before we work the problem. So D is obviously the dioptric power of the cornea that we're looking for here. But what's this N prime minus N business? Those are refractive indices. And so N prime is what you're entering. N is what you're leaving. So in this case, we have the refractive index of the cornea that we're going to use here, 1.3375. That's what we're entering. And we're leaving air as a light rays leave the air and hit the cornea. We're going to ignore the tear film for right now. So air has a refractive index of one, and then we're dividing by the radius of curvature. And when you do all of that, you should get something that looks like a K reading because a K reading is the refractive power of a cornea. So now that we understand how a keratometer works, uh, it's given us these two values right here. And our next question is, is this cornea more curved vertically or horizontally? And we would say, well, it's more powerful vertically, and we know that curvature equals power. We learned that in the first lecture. But is there a reason why that's true? I mean, we've been told that it's true, but why is that? So let me introduce you to a little thing called Snell's Law. Snell's Law says, as it's stated here, light rays passing from a higher to lower refractive index will bend away from the normal. What does any of that mean? Well, as you can see here in the diagram, we have water on one side with a higher refractive index than air on the other side. And as that ray leaves the water and enters the air, it is going to bend away from the normal. The normal is that dotted line that's perpendicular to the change in the refractive index. So it's the dotted line. The red ray in that diagram indicates what would happen if the ray didn't bend at all, so an undeviated ray. And so in respect to that undeviated ray, it's going to bend away from the normal. Now, what if you're going from a low refractive index into a higher refractive index? Well, as these rays leave the air and enter a higher refractive index, water, it's going to bend toward that normal, that dotted line, with respect to the undeviated red ray. And that's Snell's Law. One caveat of Snell's Law is that if your rays are hitting that interface perpendicular, in other words, parallel to the normal, those rays are not going to bend one way or the other. And it doesn't matter what the difference is between the refractive index of one to the other. It's just not going to bend. Now here's why we care. Look at the top part of this diagram. We have rays going from a high refractive index of whatever that lens is made of out into air, a lower refractive index with a refractive index of one. And as you can see, as the rays go through, they are bending away from the normal, Snell's law, high to low, away from the normal with respect to the red undeviated ray. And so those rays are bending down. And if we look at the bottom diagram, it's doing the same thing. But notice how the normal is pointed a different way. But still, we are going from high refractive index to low refractive index. It bends away from the normal. It obeys the law. And so it is, again, bending away from the normal with respect to the red undeviated ray. Because these two rays are now bending in different directions, you can see that they are going to converge. And so this is a plus lens. This is why a plus lens has this shape. So this is why curvature has power. And speaking of power, sometimes you get powerfully hungry. And if you're ever in Bartlett, Tennessee, there is a little restaurant called Fat Larry's that serves up the best barbecue in the entire country. Everyone says that their best barbecue is such and such place, but it turns out that it's in Bartlett, Tennessee. Now you can see here we've got some ribs with some dry rub on it over there on your left at the top of the plate. 
Right beside it is some pulled pork with some marvelous uh, barbecue sauce that you see in the little container beside it. You can't really see the brisket, or it could be that I've already eaten the brisket. It's so good. And then you can see all the sides right here. So Fat Larry's Bartlett, Tennessee just happens to be best barbecue in the entire country. So in our journey through astigmatism, it's important that we be able to speak with our colleagues and relay the information that we're seeing in a language that we all use. And so here we go. This is the first naming convention that we have for astigmatism. With the rule. Here we see a patient with the following K readings. They're steeper at 90 versus 180. If you put this uh, eye in topography, this is what you would see. Uh, your topographer may give you different results, but basically you're seeing a bow tie so that that line is going straight up and down. That is called with the rule astigmatism. So here we have a visual aid of with the rule astigmatism, which is why football was invented. As you can see, if we were to walk along the laces, if we were a tiny jogger, let's say, and we were going to jog along the laces, it wouldn't be a very difficult jog relative to if we were to start uh, in the middle of the football, go up where it says steep, go across the laces, and then down the other side. That would be uh, a heck of a jog to get across there. So it's much steeper going that way compared to going across the laces. So a football is very astigmatic. If we had a basketball, it wouldn't matter uh, which direction we went around the ball because uh, that curvature is the same in every direction. So a basketball is an example of a spherical cornea, whereas a football is an example of an aspheric or astigmatic cornea. And if you ever forget what with the rule of astigmatism is, just remember that a football lying down like this, ready to be hiked, is with the rule of astigmatism. So steep, going vertically up and down, and relatively flat, going horizontally. The concept of with the rule of astigmatism has been around for a very, very long time. Looking back at our keratometer from the 1930s, it's stamped there on the side. You can see in the magnified view, uh, but no telling how far back this dates. Now, of course, if we have with the rule, we're going to have to have against the rule, and that is going to mean steep going horizontally versus uh, being flat vertically. So you can see by the K readings here, you can see what the topography would look like for against the rule. So knowing that, you can now glance at any topography, and if the line, the heavy line is going in this horizontal direction, you can immediately say, hey, that's against the rule. I don't have to think about it anymore. And back to our football. Once again, if we go in the direction of the laces, that is relatively flat versus going perpendicular to the laces, which is steep. And that's what these K readings are telling you. Of course, there are lots of meridians other than vertical and horizontal. Let's take a look at those. So this is called oblique astigmatism. Look at these Ks. They're nowhere near 180, 0, 90, or 270. Uh, for example, here we are at 40, 220, and you can see right here. So oblique astigmatism is when we are 20 or more away from that 90, 180. Why 20 or more? Uh, there are different uh, textbooks that will give you different values. Some will say more than 15. Some will say more than 30. Uh, we use 20 in this series as the definition of oblique. Want to see a football? So here it is, we have a football tilted uh, to the appropriate degree, and that would represent oblique astigmatism. Now, suppose we let the air out of the football until it just becomes this lumpy, bumpy surface. There are corneas that are like this as well, at least optically speaking. They look perfectly normal most of the time on slit lamp exam. But in these irregular astigmatism corneas, there is no one meridian that is the strongest versus a flat meridian 90 degrees away that is the weakest. And you'll see that on topography. You're not going to see these great looking bow ties like you're used to seeing. Now, regular astigmatism, uh, such as with the rule is regular against the rule and oblique are all regular. You'll notice that the K readings are 90 degrees apart and that's the regularity of, of it. But in irregular astigmatism, not true. So what's the big deal about having an irregular cornea? The big deal is that glasses don't really work here. If there's a regular component to it, the glasses might help some, but in some cases there's so much irregularity that your glasses uh, don't work at all no matter how long you spend on the refraction. 
That's because, again, the surface optically is not smooth. However, we can give it an artificially smooth surface, such as putting an RGP on top of an irregular cornea, and that is one treatment for irregular astigmatism. I will tell you that learning astigmatism is often confusing and challenging, and the concepts uh, kind of get jumbled up. And I think that's because typically when we're talking astigmatism, we're talking treatment and pathology, and it's all kind of mixed up. I think we need to really keep those concepts separate. So all we've talked about so far is pathology. What is astigmatism? All about curvature, uh, a naming system for astigmatism. So you hopefully by now understand the pathology of what is going on. And so when we get to part two, because we're going to stop the lecture here, when we get to the next lecture, part two of astigmatism, we're going to just focus on the treatment of that pathology. I really want those separated in your brain. I think that that makes it much easier to wrap your head completely around astigmatism. So I'm going to sign off now, and I do hope that you come back and join me for astigmatism part two. Thank you for spending some time with me.